My talk is based on certain uh, uh, translations uh, of a memoir that I have recently done, which was part of a new series that is being started by a journal called Contributions to Indian Sociology, which wanted to bring regional language uh, literature of some sociological import to the English speaking uh, audience. So that's the context in which this particular piece was written. Um, it is certainly the first time that I'm actually officially doing and writing, uh, you know, in the genre of a translation. So, uh, but um, the, 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 my talk will be based on this, this recent publication. Um, the memoir that I, I, I translated, and I translated only selected parts of it, were written, uh, uh, is written by a Gujarati uh, writer called Sharifa Vijayvala. It was published in uh, fairly recently in 2015. Uh, it is called Sambandh Manu Akash or a sky full of relationships and it's a collection of essays and um, now as a political scientist interested in the broader questions of identity politics civil society and democracy in Gujarat and and India at large um, I found the avowedly personal genre of the memoir a largely untapped and rich source for much of the material political ethnographers usually work with uh, for instance, uh, historically situated thick descriptions about the lives of individuals located in particular social settings. And I thought the memoir was a great source for this. But let me say at the outset um, that the reflections based on this memoir can go in, in, in several fascinating directions, such as the literary value of a memoir, uh, methodological questions um, about its ethnographic validity and archival value, or questions about the act of translation, and the authorial voice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, I will not go into these issues um, um, given the constraints of time. Uh, and my, I, I will restrict my talk to the social scientific insights I draw from the four essays that I have translated from Bijli Wala's memoir. So I will, I will make two central claims. Uh, first, I see this memoir not merely as a personal story of a contemporary individual. Uh, who is remarkable in so many ways. Actually, Sharifa Vishniwala is currently the head of the Department of Gujarati at uh, South Gujarat uh, uh, University in Surat. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, she is very much a contemporary figure. She is a highly acclaimed writer. She has won several Sahitya Academy Awards, um, um, Gujarati Sahitya Academy Awards, and national awards for her writings. So, she's a known figure in, in, in the kind of Gujarati literary scene. But I see this not just as a personal story of a remarkable person, but one that offers a peek into the bigger canvas of Gujarati civil society and Indian democracy. It provides important insights into the social political fabric of rural Gujarat, particularly Saurashtra region, uh, or also known as Kathiawad. Um, since the 1970s, or in the 1970s, and the changing urban landscape of the state today. The overarching concern of the essays uh, that I'm, I have translated is with the contestations and predicaments about place, <coughs> literally and figuratively, um, within the larger matrix of Gujarati society. They're concerned with the location and dislocation of specific individuals and groups in Gujarat and the transactions they must make in order to survive and thrive within its social political order. So that's one thing. This is much more. Uh, you know, this is a story through a memoir, the story of Gujarat in some ways and, and of Indian democracy. Um, and second, I want to draw attention to the fact that the social drama concerning socio-economically and politically marginalized groups in the memoir uh, and the story of their aspirations and mobility in the backdrop um, that is happening and unfolding in the backdrop of shifting political ideologies of the state and citizenship within Gujarat and uh, in India since 1947 to the present, especially in the post-liberalization uh, era. And I think that's the, the context within which this whole um, thing is unfolding. Now, the four essays I will discuss um, are, uh, uh, one is called Gamna Otar, or The Village Rogue, uh, which is about a Muslim outcast of the village. Um, the second is Bijalma, which concerns a poor Dalit woman. Uh, the third is Kaya Sambandhe, uh, which means what relations, uh, which is about a serendipitous encounter with an unknown Hindu woman. And uh, Dharti no Chedo Ghar, or All ro roads, roads Lead to Home, which deals with the elusive quest for home and belonging. 
Now, uh, these are all events and snapshots from Vijayawala's life that she has sort of written in in, in this memoir. Now, open, uh, 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 you know, um, these essays are open to divergent interpretations, um, and uh, it maybe may be read also as depicting the triumph of a Gujarati Muslim woman from a rural background who rises above tremendous poverty uh, to achieve remarkable professional success and social recognition. Uh, from this perspective, her story is an inspiring model uh, that attests to the opportunities available to hardworking people in entrepreneurial Gujarati society. Now, that's one way to read this memoir. Now, in contrast to this, this view, this mainstream view, my reading of the memoir explores several questions of interest uh, to social scientists. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in uh, addressing the following questions. Where are these people, the author and her family, located within the physical geography and political economy of Gujarat? Uh, Uh, within the especially in, in in the hinterland in the 1970s how do yeah how did the state and civil society in Gujarat intervene in their plight if at all and is it possible to discern any shifts in the responsibility and complicity of the state and civil society vis-a-vis -vis the lives of marginalized peoples in the context of economic liberalization what are the opportunities choices and resources available to these people in climbing up the social hierarchy and what lies beyond the broad polarities of inclusion and exclusion um, as such individuals negotiate their place within Gujarati society and, and politics. So these are uh, just some opening remarks. What I will do is I will actually read uh, parts of, of, of every story and then I will sort of conclude with, uh, with my reflections. The first one is, um, is uh, Gamno Otar which is about uh, which which translates as the village road uh, it is about uh, you know this uh, the village road rogue okay rogue, rogue. yeah r o g g u t um or a vagabond but he's not really a vagabond uh, so uh, so uh, so he's a, it could also be a kind of an outcast but not in a caste sense you know utar is what uh, the the word means gam no utar so it's about uh, the the story opens with uh, with a kind of a very big tragedy that has struck the kind of the the Vijayawala family. Okay, a paralyzing silence hung over our entire household as if struck by a deadly bolt of lightning. It was the creepy stillness of a cremation ground. Bapu, my father, was sitting in the courtyard, his head buried in his palms. Our house was situated far away from the town, sitting in the midst of, the, of thick groves comprising babul and boar trees. But as the word spread, people began to pour in from far away places, crowding into our courtyard. So, you know, this is the Vijayawala family kind of living on the edge of, of a, a fairly nondescript village. Throughout the, the memoir, you hardly even get to know the name of the village uh, in which uh, this family is living. We know it is in, in Saurashtra. Uh, we know the towns and villages surrounding this this nondescript village near the uh, you know the near Bhavnagar, but we we hardly know about this kind of faceless place and there are houses on the edge of um, of the village. The plight and and something has happened and the, the you know the whole village is now pouring into their their courtyard. The plight of our family was well known. Everyone in the town knew how hard Bapu had struggled to make two ends meet running his household and putting us through school on the mega income he earned from selling newspapers right so these are uh, sharifa bijliwala is part of uh, uh, you know uh, you know a family of four siblings father is just selling newspapers the year was 1972 i had just passed class four examinations and was about to enter the school in songar in class five so songar is uh, a nearby village uh, my sister was leaving uh, having passed her matriculation and she had already secured admission in the PT course run by an institution called Lok Bharti in Sano Sira. Uh, but Lok Bharti required that fees for six months be paid in advance. Bapu managed this amount by borrowing from a few people here and there. And now, you know, uh, we are already told about the poor economic conditions of this family. The oldest girl in this family is now uh, about to go uh, to for higher studies, and this father has, you know. Uh, Low, you know, gathered uh, money with great difficulty. 
And what happens is putting together his two pairs of khadi apparel and, uh, and other assorted items, Bapu was ready to embark upon his journey, escorting my sister to Sarosra. The calamity struck when he put his hand in his pocket to buy the ticket on board the bus. The pocket was picked. The money was gone. All of the rupees 300 that had been gathered laboriously by Bapu um, after borrowing from several people. The thief had not left anything behind, even to buy the bus ticket. A cloud of sadness descended over the entire household as if somebody had died in the family. Ba, uh, means mother, was almost inconsolable, falling short of beating her chest in grief. And so this is a tragedy that is struck. Uh, you know, the eldest sister is about to go uh, for studies. Uh, you know, all this money has been picked. You know, and come to think of it, and I'm just reading parts of it, I'm skipping others, come to think of it, on the one hand, it was a loss of 300 rupees, but on the other, it would wreck uh, the very prospect of my sister's future education. God only knows if any one of us could have studied further if a stop was put on her studies. Now, suddenly, Osman Bhai, the village cycle repair man, appeared at the front gate. Although he lived by the sweat of his brow, people did not socialize with him much because of his drinking habits and the questionable company he kept in town. For a moment, everyone was surprised to find him at our doorstep. But then, today, all kinds of people had turned up uh, who had never stopped by our house, uh, you know, and they had come to express sorrow. So it's interesting. This is a Muslim family living at the edge of the town. And people in the village have found out what has happened, and everyone is just coming there to 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 kind of express their uh, their sorrow um, and to you know just kind of consolations. Come to think of it, um, uh, so uh, Ba spread a charpo in front in the front front yard and offered him a seat. Come to think of it, Osman Bhai also happened to be the brother of my Ba's good friend. We used to address him as Mama if ever we had an occasion to speak to him. Uh, so, Osman Bhai comes, asks some questions about when exactly the pocket was picked and then he disappears, right? And all of this is happening and the next day, in the evening, he reappears into the family's courtyard, right? And um, uh, the next day, uh, you know, everyone was still mourning and then in the evening, they hear the gate open. We all jumped up from our bed immediately. Life at the edge of the jungle had made our reflexes very sharp. As we brightened up the lantern, we saw Osman Bhai standing there. What is this rogue doing here at this time, muttered Ba under her breath as she laid a charcoal for him to sit. Osman Bhai put rupees 285 in Bapu's hand as he sat down and said, I know all the crooks in the area very well. The moment I heard your story, I immediately realized who must have practiced his art on you. I landed up in Sihor and the work was done. But the blighter had already spent 15 rupees from the amount. And you know very well my condition. Otherwise, I would have added up my own money for your daughter, for my daughter, for my daughter. So he says, his eyes were glazed, his voice choking. Osman Bhai got up and left in the darkness. Maybe this rogue did not have the courage to see the tears in our eyes. So this story sort of ends here. This is the story of their interaction with this unknown, you know, kind of um, character. Um, uh, and I will, uh, I will speak more about him uh, later. The next one is. Uh, Vijalma, which is about this Dalit woman. So these are all the characters uh, that you know we we learn, uh, and the time also is very significant. All of this is happening in the 1970s. Uh, this is 1970s Saurashtra. Uh, Saurashtra also has a very particular kind of history, very distinct from mainland Gujarat, uh, and that will also be, uh, I think, quite uh, important to understand. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Vijalma. Uh, I never knew, really knew her uh, her real name, but we called her Vijalma. Ever since I can remember, Vijalma would visit our home. Um, and then there's a physical description of her, you know, how she wore her particular kind uh, kind of jewelry, uh, you know, and attire. And we are told that on every festive occasion, Vijalma would visit our home to offer some grain, Jawar, Baja, and drop a rupee or two in the hands of us children. But we always wondered how exactly Vijalma was related to us. Mother used to call her Mashi or aunt or mother's sister. A woman who herself struggled to fill her hungry stomach never failed to give us something and help my mother. One day I simply could not resist asking her, Vijalma, how are you related to my mother? And she answered, uh, you know, uh, she gave a kind of a vague answer which says, you know, 
Your mother's village and my maternal village were hardly a couple of villages apart. And I'm her aunt on account of being from within the 10 village radius, you know. And since your mother does not have a mother, it is my duty to look after her, isn't it? You know? And that's the answer she gives. This is how I'm related to you. I'm Hamashi because, you know, I'm from nearby her village. And, uh, you know, um, so, you know, this character keeps coming throughout her, her, her growing up years. This Vijal Marvel regularly shows up at their house. And as soon as she would arrive, tea would be made. Um, and our house was again on the edge of the village in a desolate area. So you, you know they're, you know, uh, uh, where they are located physically. Um, a small cup with a broken handle always lay in the corner of our dusty courtyard. And as soon as tea was ready to be strained, Vijalma would get that cup uh, um, with a broken handle and rinse it with water. And then tea would be poured into that cup. This would make me mad and lose my temper. I would insist on straining the tea into a saucer. In Kathiawar, you drink tea in a saucer. Uh, you don't drink it in a cup. But Vijalma had a cup that she would use, you know, and um, and I would insist on straining it. Um, um, uh, but Vijalma would have none of it. No bone. Uh, we are dead. Uh, a caste of untouchables. Um, if I pollute your religion, I will go to hell. And in my mind, I would scrutinize <coughs> such religious claims over and over again. So this is when she reveals that, you know, she is actually a date, which is an untouchable caste. And as such, I had little patience for practices of purity and pollution. So many of our goat, uh, our buddies, or Gothiao, would never drink water from the earthen pot at our home. Now she's talking about the Vijaliwala household. And many would agree to offer us water only by pouring it from some distance directly into our cupped palms as we extended our hands towards them. And so as to avoid direct physical contact with us. As a child, I would oblige without objection when asked to drink water in this fashion. But as I grew older, I resisted this practice and refused to drink from the hands of such people. I decided that I would not accept water from people who had problems offering me water because they believed I would pollute them. Now imagine how wrong it felt when Vijalma refused to drink tea from the saucer in my own house. But till her death, she never gave up her handleless cup. Um, and um, it goes on to really kind of talk about how Vijalma constantly comes to help this family in times of their financial crisis, even as, at a time when she's actually just a completely daily wage laborer. You know, she hardly has a steady income. She has no family. And that's really uh, the remarkable thing about this character. And, um, and it ends with how uh, Sharifa Bindiwala and her sister sort of give, when they get their first salary, give a part of that salary to, to Vijalma as, you know, uh, as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, for all that she has meant uh, for them growing up. So this um, is uh, is about Vijalma. The, uh, the, the, the third story is uh, about, um, about this unknown Hindu woman whom they encounter. Uh, the story starts with this uh, a major storm, uh, uh, rainstorm that is raging, uh, their house is uh, literally crumbling. The ceiling, uh, you know, kind of roof, roof is almost caving in. And there is this incessant rain for two, three days. Um, and it's not stopping. And now <coughs> it has become uh, physically dangerous for the family to continue to live in this place. Um, and what happens is that um, somebody from the village comes to get this family uh, out of their house. Uh, we don't know who it is. But there are not just one person, but several people from the village come to take them out and take them to a kind of a safer refuge of some other person's house, whom we later find out is a, some, is a Brahmin, whose family is actually currently out of town, and they give them refuge in this house, uh, you know, while the, the rain uh, still uh, is raging. Okay. So... Um, so, so, so this is when they're sitting in this room, uh, kind of huddled together in this cold, uh, you know, in this other, in someone else's house. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the, there is a description of the scene. Sat staring at each other in dim light, we saw Savita Ben approaching, holding her tiny little girl in her hand. She was <coughs> just three houses away and had recently moved into the neighborhood. She sat down as she greeted us, uh, you know, and... Um, and she made some sort of exchange, some pleasantries about, you know, the crazy rain, etc. And then she gives her little daughter to them and says, can you please hold her? She won't stop crying. And she goes away uh, and then comes back <coughs> after some time 
with a whole load of bhakris which are you know a particular kind of roti and and uh, you know save dungri mushak which is this uh, this particular kind of uh, you know uh, sabzi and gives it to this family whom she knows is is hungry you know has probably not eaten and she just leaves right and she says not a word um, and so uh, you know uh, vijay wala is sort of reflecting on this this event this kind of serendipitous interaction with this unknown hindu woman right um and she says even today heavy rain stir um up the memories of that meal which lingers not just on our tongues but in our hearts what was that bond between us and that woman who which prompted her to cook a meal for us that night i'm still searching for an answer so that's why she she calls this kaya sambandha what were the relations between us and this woman to suddenly appear and sort of uh, look after us now all of this with this uh, these are sort of snapshots from the 1970s and 80s um, it also tells you something about the social context in which uh, gujarati society existed at that time uh, there were a, there was a i think a fair amount of sharp caste gender uh, religious uh, distinctions and and hierarchies you know i don't think that uh, they didn't exist obviously vijalma uh, osman bhai all these people uh you know but it's it's interesting uh how in these stories uh you see a particular place that exists for this 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 muslim family within the larger matrix of the society there is a kind of where everyone has a place but uh there are these interactions that are possible uh you know that are in fact even normal to some extent i mean she's rem reminiscing about these extraordinary memories but but they're not extraordinary in 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 their huma uh, humaneness so much as sort of that this was possible in the social world of 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 gujarat uh, of Sau of saurashtra in the 1970s <coughs> the last story and I, i'll have more to say about this in in my final comments the last story and i'll also read a small chunk from it is called dharti ro chhedo ghar which means all uh, roads lead to home and this is a story from the present this is the only story which is about her life today in uh, in uh, in in surat actually which is uh, one of the biggest cities uh, of gujarat very urban right um, in the intervening years the vijliwala household has actually managed to educate all their children uh, uh, sharifa vijliwala's uh, brother has become a doctor uh, you know she herself has gained a phd and become a professor in in, in a university and there is an obvious story of Uh, upward so uh, economic mobility certainly right um and so uh, and 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 uh, you know and and a certain kind of social status right and so now we are we come to sort of contemporary gujarat in this story and um and this is how it goes it says i'm sure that in all languages of the world the most beautiful word must be home isn't that the reason they all say um, they say all roads in the world lead to home in my case i had no luck with this word home till last month home to me seemed like a distant dream half my life had passed pining for my home but it was only recently that i stepped into a room which i could call my own now uh, it is a search of this it is in search of this home that i have dashed my head against so stone like walls erected by society um so the whole story is about how she is actually trying to get house in not in the village she's obviously made this journey to the city and she says till the year 1991 i enjoyed the royal comfort of living in the hansa mehta hostel in in baroda this is a this is a hostel part of the ms university you know and she 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 for you know all her life has been a teacher so she lived pretty much in the girls hostel right that's how she spent most of her time and um i began my struggle in search of a home while she was living in a hostel having been brought up in a tiny little village in saurashtra i had always witnessed one's religion kept within the confines of one's home i had never considered the festivals of navratra holi or diwali not to be my own on the day of ganesh chauth we received laddus from our neighbors in quantities enough for our entire family to feast upon and on the day of eid ba my mother cooked kheer in a huge vessel meant to be shared with everyone until i left for baroda uh, for studies it was my sole right to narrate religious stories to the women folk in the village on occasions of uh, bol chauth nag panchmi uh, shitala satam 
these are all the sort of uh, uh, you know uh, festive uh, Hindu festive occasions. These were hardly uh, there was hardly an event in anybody's house in the village involving a katha or a bhajan, which my sister and I were not involved in organizing. So she's already telling you how she was really very much adept at singing bhajans and all of that. Um, having studied in Dayanand Saraswati Gurukul school, uh, I had memorized chants like Gayatri Mantra, Hanuman Chalisa, uh, etc., etc., in addition to several devotional songs and bhajans. I was also a vegetarian. She reveals uh, this as well. Um, at no point of time had I ever felt that I was in any way different from the rest. But rejections from all the builders of Surat, about 65 of them, 65 builders in Surat, uh, 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 to my queries about buying a house shook me to the core. It shook the very foundation of my belief of being a human. The kinds of answers I received were, if I were to allot you a house, we cannot sell our other flats. Why don't you go to your own area? No, we, can, we, can trust, uh, we can't trust you near us, Muslims. Some more decent among them advised me, buy the house in somebody else's name or use a short abbreviated name. These answers dragged my self-respect to rock bottom. Um, I kept arguing like crazy, but it was like dashing against a wall. The bitter fact was that my colleagues, women belonging to scheduled castes or scheduled tribes, managed to buy a house, but not me. Um, I wondered, I could teach your children, advise them about your life, their life course, lecture about Ramayana and Mahabharata, but I cannot stay in your neighborhood. Why? If I am also a human being and an Indian, why should there be a separate place for me? Uh, so, so this is how, uh, and that's where I will sort of end, uh, you know, uh, her uh, her uh, memoirs, and I'm going to now kind of end with my uh, comments on some of these uh, pieces. So, in the three accounts uh, titled uh, "The Village Rogue," "Bijalma," and "What Relations," it is possible to discern two interrelated social processes. First is a moral geography of deprivation, where the landless poor characters eke out a life of subsistence and struggle to meet the bare necessities of life. The Dalit woman, the Muslim man, and a caste Hindu woman in the three essays are located in the lowest rung of the class hierarchy of the village. But importantly, what connects them is not just their economic vulnerability alone, but a complex moral geography of deprivation alongside long-standing traditions of religious pluralism in Saurashtra. Um, and, and Saurashtra in that sense is very different from mainland Gujarat because of a history of a far more syncretic kind of a uh, Hinduism, uh, you know, uh, and its a, 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 and its a, a intersections of it, uh, you know, a culture of peers, uh, you know, and uh, Sufism, <coughs> etc. Some of the figures, such as Osman Bhai, operate on the border of legality and illegality, and their interactions reveal how the informal network of the poor in this setting rely upon. Uh, uh, how they rely upon these informal networks in the face of a near absent and inefficient state. You see, pretty much the state is completely absent in terms of its, um, you know, its its infrastructure or or any kind of basic uh, so, uh, services. Often, their transactions for social security and survival rest on nothing more than serendipitous encounters and personal empathy of good Samaritans across the divides of caste and religion. The relationship between Vijalma's mother, uh, I mean Vijniwala's mother and Vijalma, too, offers a less studied dimension of Dalit Muslim interactions. These relations have been discussed largely in terms of class solidarity between Dalit and Muslim laborers in the context of the textile mills in Ahmedabad in the social science literature in Gujarat. Interestingly, uh, caste is never explicitly mentioned in these memoirs. Um, except when Vijama reveals her quote unquote untouchable identity to justify the rituals of purity and separation that govern her interaction uh, with the household. Uh, the Vijayawada household stood in a desolate place on the edge of the village with no civic amenities to speak of. The inefficient and largely absent state of the 1970s and 80s had limited capacity to provide for welfare. Um, except for a small but fairly decent primary and secondary school in which the family's children could gain entry and obtain an education. Uh, this is something she talks about in the memoir, how she's so indebted to that, 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 that school in the village. Absolutely ordinary, but, but she talks about her extraordinary teachers who really, you know, kind of, it was not the physical resources, but what she got in schooling that really she sees as the key to her mobility later on in life. 
From their place on the outskirts of the village, the author's family manages to be an integral part of the rural political economy of the village. Their severe economic deprivation and vulnerability does not undermine their active social engagements and interactions with the people in the village. For instance, in All Roads Lead to Home, uh, Vijniwala reminisces about her childhood when she and her younger sister actively participated in all these Hindu uh, rituals, festivals, etc., etc. Uh, indicating an exchange of the non-economic kind across communal boundaries. Uh, when her father had his money stolen on the momentous occasion of her sister's departure for higher education, a lot of people turned up at their house to offer their sympathy. I mean, this is something significant. This is, she, this is not a family living in a Muslim ghetto. Uh, and nor are all the people coming and showing concern Muslim inside. In fact, we don't hear of other Muslims in the, in the village, uh, you know, um, except, of course, there are people like Osman. Uh, the second process visible in these narratives is, is an account of the aspirations that motivate socially, socio-economically marginalized individuals to rise above their circumstances. The story of the village rogue is as much about the humanity of a man living on the edge of legality as it is about the tremendous aspiration of a poor family to educate its children. Even in the face of their severely limited means, the family's faith in education as a passport to a better life and a means of escaping from the drudgery of poverty remains strong. This faith represented an unwritten but solemn compact between the Indian state, civil society, and the underprivileged. It was based on a mutually shared belief in the promise of inclusive citizenship enshrined in the Indian constitution. Uh, so there is, I mean, there was some hope that, you know, if we kind of got an education, you know, the state would, you know, uh, doesn't have enough, but we could still sort of be part of the story of India, you know. Um, uh, uh, but what is the future of this unwritten compact, this compact between the state and the civil society, um, uh, you know, and the marginalized of the state? The final essay deals precisely uh, with this question. And, and um, I'm going to now uh, end. The final essay, uh, uh, All Roads Lead to Home, discusses the contemporary moment and identifies disturbing trends in Gujarat civil society today. Uh, the author returns to her village in present-day Gujarat to find a transformed landscape where her house once stood. Her own house has been rebuilt by her brother as a comfortable abode that is nothing like the humble uh, Kasambhaini Jhupri uh, of her childhood, which is what her father's house was called. Uh, just like her family's upward mobility, there are obvious signs of prosperity. Her, the face of her village is now changed. This, you know, uh, but she is consumed by a nagging sense that something is amiss in the new arrangements of this place. Her yearning for her old house is not simply a case of nostalgia, rather it is a commentary on the viscerally felt deepening of communal polarities at the civic and political levels that seem to leave her with a sense of dislocation today. Her journey to the city represents economic mobility, but one that is accompanied by the erosion of an earlier amity that guided inter-community relations in the rural setting. The distinct placement of groups in the village of her childhood, which were named but allowed for cross-cutting ties, had been replaced by exclusionary relationships based on religion that are now an integral reality of rural and urban Gujarat. Although Vijayawala underplays the Muslimness of her characters, um, the implications of her being Muslim later be begin to define the trajectory of her life. Um, it is in the city, prop, uh, popularly believed to be a haven for anonymity, that she is forced to be Muslim and fall in line um, with the ascribed identity associated with her name. Her professed vegetarianism, her enthusiastic participation in Hindu rituals as a child in rural Gujarat, and other physical markers that evade religious stereotyping do not come to her rescue. The author's experiences of rejection and discrimination in the search for a house in the city uh, you know, deeply shakes her beliefs. And ultimately, Vijliwala's elusive quest for a home of her own and her struggle for a place in the social matrix of Gujarati society, despite her status as an award-winning writer and public intellectual, lays bare the anatomy of what I'm calling the anatomy of abdication that currently ails Gujarat state and civil society. The issue is more complex and sinister than mere dereliction of the state's duty. It is about the state's abdication of its commitment to equality and pluralism, a serious breach that is carried out in collusion with civil society. Uh, this process of the state's abdication is in intricately linked, I think, with economic liberalization in India, enshrined in its policy since 1991, which called for the withdrawal of state services and greater privatization. 
Since the 1970s and 80s, there has been a global rise of the free market ideology with its accompanying fictions about individual merit, privatization, and economic growth as a solution of human deprivation and environmental degradation. The concluding story in her memoir may be read as an ominous warning about the future of Indian democracy in Gujarat, given the erosion of faith in the constitutional compact among its marginalized citizens. And I'll end here. Thank you so much. Just, uh, you know, this is a uh, wonderful uh, translation and uh, makes for a wonderful reading experience. And Mona has uh, very skillfully skilled through uh, sections of Shari Kavijaliwal's memoir to identify some key strands such as alienation, dislocation, and anguish inspired by desire to belong that she clubs together under what she calls the moral geographies of deprivation. Uh, deprivation thus becomes the key trope uh, for making larger observations about state and civil society in Gujarat in the post-liberalization era. And, um, you know, the um, intersubjectivity of the text is indeed what perhaps makes Mona select it uh, for translation. And the essays have been translated in a very lucid manner, as I've said, they made for a wonderful reading experience. Um, the memoir from what we uh, get to read through these translations has also been fairly eloquent in telling the story of Vijali Wals and her um, family's evolving trajectory of the of everyday struggle and pain that migration to an apparently anonymous and more permissive city actually accentuated. And migration to the city produced a sense of alienation and reduced the author's uh, sense of belongingness. And Mona asks very pertinent questions about the application of the state and the viability of such a model of application and withdrawal, as well as the fundamental question of the nation state's failure to deliver on the promise of an inclusive society. Um, if I may rephrase our question, uh, what then is the basis of the state's claim that it is democratic and that it promotes a pluralistic society? A very valid question indeed and a strong indictment of both state and civil society in many ways. Uh, Mona's other comment about the usefulness of autobiographies and memoirs uh, to tease out larger sociological insights is also well taken and this method has been put to good use by social scientists in the past and I happen to be so full, uh, you know, I'm teaching a course at the moment and I cannot help sharing with you how um, uh, it has been done very well in this particular book uh, by Carlo Ginsberg, which is called The Cheese and the Worms, um, which is a story of a 16th century miller, uh, basically Menocchio and his wall. His personal reflections, testimonies and statements have been effectively used by the author to make larger observations about popular culture in its relation with literary high culture in the form of books and print. Now, I just wanted to read out a one or two lines from this book where the author says, and I quote, the fact that the source is not objective does not mean that it is useless. And, it, and even meager, scattered, and obscure documentation can be put to good use. He says, but the fear of falling into a notorious naive positivism combined with the exasperated awareness of the ideological distortion that may lurk behind the most normal and seemingly innocent process of perception prompts many historians today to discard popular culture together with the sources that provide a more or less distorted picture of it. So this is basically about uh, memoirs and the usefulness in you know, drawing larger sociological insights. Um, uh, so, so um, I must add here that not everybody would believe in the efficacy of relying solely on a single person's testimony to talk about society at large for all the obvious reasons. However, taken um, collectively, such personal testimonies as Nurva Shibutalia does can be a powerful genre that can allow us to build alternative meta narratives. And I'm deliberately using this label to refer to anything and everything about a micro narrative, although even a micro narrative is never simply about individual experiences, but about the socially embedded experiences of the individual. So, so much for the methodology. Uh, but to come back to the essay, I have some questions for the same speaker. One is, um, uh, the first one is that uh, the expression um, moral geography, and I'm asking you, uh, Mona, the expression moral geography seems to me to club together all kinds of the failure or all kinds of failure of the state society compact. 
uh, and to iron out all kinds of alienation as essentially similar. Now, I'm trying to think what such an approach would do to the tremendous scholarship in the social sciences that has talked about the discrete experiences of class, gender, religion, and caste. Um, now, um, uh, these um, personalized accounts uh, certainly enable us to overcome the excesses of broad theorization, such as how caste can be used to complicate class and so on. But, um, uh, you know, there is certainly some merit perhaps in acknowledging the tremendous insights generated and the possibilities that, are, you know, that have been, um, that have emerged out of the works and scholarship belong to, belonging to this genre that is on class and so on. This is one. And secondly, the connection between um, uh, liberalization and the absence of pluralism vis-a-vis -vis the abdication of the state is, is, is not very clear to me. Uh, the state seems to be there very much, only present, if you will, um, in uh, encouraging an exclusivist social culture. And that was also the argument that you seem to make, to spell out, in fact, in so many words. Uh, so then how do you think liberalization and uniculturalism are related? So these are the two questions to the speaker. And um, But I, I think at the end what seems eminently hurting is how a popular civil society rather than a high civil society still enables humane and emotive exchanges even if this is somewhat serendipitous. <laughs>